Somehow, you know, when or Oren divided all this up, I got the opportunity to talk about the murder of John. Okay? I mean, that was perfect. And I'm sure that a lot of you know the story and everything, and you're thinking, okay, what pictures did Steve come up with with a picture of John the Baptist's head on a platter? There are a bunch out there, but I did not use any of those. Okay, yes, yes. We're, we're, we took it a little bit different path, and so it's a good thing. Anyway, one of those things that we kind of are going to learn in this a little bit is that familiarity does breed contempt. And one of those things is this particular story, you probably all know it. So we're going to try to take some different looks at it, we hope, and pique your interest in some fashion. Um, I stuck with the idea of the murder of John the Baptist, but it just easily could have said the cruel consequences of speaking against morally corrupt government leaders. And brought it into today's uh, <laughs> vernacular, which is the same thing that he suffered. But I didn't want anybody to think this is some sort of a political stand. So, uh, first of all, before we jump in on this passage, we'll do a quick review on the stuff that Warren covered last week. So, in the beginning of Mark, um, Mark 6, verses 1 through 6, we see Jesus going back to his hometown of, of, fill in the blank, Nazareth. Yeah, very good. Someone, somebody was here last week. Okay, so he goes back to his own town of Nazareth, and one might expect, here's a guy that's coming back. He has been traveling around. He has healed the sick, cast out demons, raised people from the dead, and you would think that if he got back to his hometown around his family and around those that knew him, that he would get a hero's welcome, right? And really, what he did was in Mark 6, verse 2, the passage does say, many of them who heard him teach in the synagogue there were astonished. And that astonishment, that uh, wonder and everything over Jesus lasted all the way until verse 3. One verse later. Um, so you get to verse 3, and the very last couple of verses talks about not only weren't they not astonished, but that says that they took offense at him. So here is his family. There are people that knew him. And they said, hey, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't he just a carpenter? And so on and so forth. And they were, because of that idea of familiarity breeds contempt, they kind of downplayed everything that he had done. Now, Jesus finally said in verse 4, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. So the consequences of their uh, unbelief and disdain, what was it? In verse 5, it tells us that he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That was it. He had done all sorts of miraculous things everywhere else, but here he comes back to his hometown around his family and friends, or former friends perhaps, but nonetheless, he didn't do anything they didn't believe. And it says in verse six, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, not found in Mark, but found in Luke, it goes a step further, and some of you might be familiar with this. It said that the crowd there in Nazareth, Nazareth was so incest with him that they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw them off the cliff. Now that's something that a lot of people miss, that he was so despised that at that point in his ministry, those closest to him took him to the edge of the cliff and were gonna push him off. <laughs> but what does the Bible say that he did? Just walk right through him. Yeah, he said, but passing through their midst, he went away. Obviously, in God's timing, it wasn't his time to die. It wasn't the type of death that he was to die. I'm sure that kind of astounded the people that tried that. You know, they were right on the death, right on the verge of again. Again, you keep seeing Satan show up all throughout Jesus' life, giving him <coughs> having opportunities to try to squelch his calling, squelch what he was there to do. And sure enough, this wasn't it. Um, lesson for us there, as I just mentioned a couple minutes ago, 
Sometimes familiarity does breed contempt. And, and Mark was talking about a lot of things today. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was great was the idea that sometimes we aren't coming as much. We're not committed as much. Talk about the people that were just so committed they continued to build the wall under a lot of opposition. And yet, sometimes we do the same thing. Yeah, I've heard that Mark stuff before. Let's don't go to Steve's class. I'm not talking about Colette. <coughs> by any stretch of imagination. Else, I'm just kidding. That's everybody else, no. <laughs> or sometimes I'm on Sunday morning you wake out. up and it's 32 degrees outside and you say, you know, last thing I really want to do, perhaps it's cold outside. Maybe we'll just stay at home. Maybe we can turn on the life service at West U rather than going to Missouri City. Um, I haven't mentioned much about it, and they've been sitting here, but I'm not trying to peddle these books. I've got a whole bunch of books uh, donated to us, which is called Rediscover Church. And a lot of us don't have much time to read, but I will tell you that um, this is a great book. And really, it focuses on the whole pandemic type of thing and how still churches are, well, maybe in God's wisdom, he took a lot of folks that aren't coming back because they became maybe just a habit. And when they realized maybe they weren't missed, they made a lifestyle change and they found some other things to do. Or they use COVID as the excuse that they don't come back or things like that. So I've got a whole bunch here. I'll put a bunch at the back of the room. That's if you, new, right? That's not the, that's not, yeah, that's not the other that's one. That's not the other one. No, it's, it, this, that's is the, this is a, a new one. Great book. Um, and I'll put a whole bunch of them there. Grab one as you go out. Give it to a friend. If you know of somebody that, say, hasn't made the transition yet, there are some passages in there, and there's some chapters in there that really talk. I mean, I, I mentioned to Mark, I said, you could get five really good sermons out of this book. <laughs> and, and it would feather exactly into what he talked about today. Um, okay, so no, no idea in this whole town. So on the second half the, of what Warren talked about last week, Jesus sends out the 12. It's kind of his missions outreach training for the 12 apostles. And so really the bottom line there is rely on God and travel light. If you had to sum up everything that was said there, he says, you're not going to take this, you're not going to take that, just take a staff. And one of the other um, gospels says, don't even take your sandals. Well, you, you know, in that particular environment, you almost got to take sandals, okay? So I'm pretty sure that this one that allowed the sandals was maybe more correct. Regardless, it has some real implications. Again, as we know, when we send out missionaries, sometimes some mission board sends out groups of two. And just like Jesus did, he sent them out in twos. And a little later on, when he sent out the 70, or was it 72? When he sent out that other larger group, they also were sent out in twos. And then we see in Acts and so forth, we see Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas and so on and so forth. And so we know that that is kind of a great model. When my daughter went to Cambodia on a mission trip, she was there for five months and she flew in by herself and traveled in a bus all the way down to a remote village on the very south part of Cambodia, the killing fields, okay? And there were still tunnels in the ground and everything she found fascinating that a lot of people were still very, very scared. And it is cold in here, isn't it? We're gonna bundle up, we're gonna have blankets at the door. Um, oh, she's getting ready to make a phone call. No. Anyway, um, but one of the things they did was there were two families there and they were teamed up together. Now, I don't know how you, know, you guys handled it in Eastern Europe, but did you at different times have groups of two or is it just husband and wife? It was always better if you went in groups, but when we went, it, the wall had just come down. There weren't that many people going in, so we went in by ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and yet you still have Mark. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a better. It is a better plan if you have absolutely have more have two. And my daughter witnessed that firsthand, just the synergies between them and so forth. And a little later on, while she was there, the. Thai army because they're close to the Thailand border they were thinking of coming over and taking back a part of the land that supposedly was there and they were actually talking together with the soldiers and everything they invited them over and did different things as a group now you know a, 
a single woman certainly wouldn't work out real well. And having two men and their other and their wives there, she finds ideal. And again, ten years later, she still stays in contact with them wherever they're at in the world because that is a relationship that they built together as a team. Uh, same type of thing here. Jesus sent them out with virtually nothing, just a staff. They were dependent on others for their hospitality and support, just like we need to be giving to our missionaries, not counting on them doing everything on their own. And they also went out with kind of what's called a limited commission. He told, told them to go out to, and preach that the people should repent, cast out demons, and heal the sick. And of course, we know the Great Commission in, at the end of Matthew, Matthew uh, 28, 20, and 20, uh, 20 and Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And it says, um, go into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, and then at least in the passage that I memorized. And that's one of the things that's always kind of odd. You always have to think, okay, was it the NASB? But it says, and lo, I am with you always. Well, and that was probably King James. So I've still got all these mixed versions that come about sometimes. So now into this idea of the murder of John the Baptist. Now usually we'll read stuff together, and I had it all put up together that way, but I found a video clip where they actually read in the English Standard Version. And so what I want you to do is this. Sometimes when people put together videos, they go outside the lines, and they're gonna quote and actually read the actual passage word for word. But I want you to pay careful attention to it, first of all, because it's very short. The passage is relatively short. The video clip's very short. But when you have actors and so forth, sometimes they might miss something that you might think is not quite right. So this gets you kind of focused in on it a little bit, if you will. So with that, let's give it a try. Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he bowed to her. Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. 
Did any of you see uh, anything that struck a chord with you at all? Positive, negative? I did. What's that? Well, it just hit me that Herod was glad. I think that's the word they used for, with Jesus, or with John the Baptist. But then, and I don't, and this may be reading into it, but it's almost reminds me of a metaphor because then because of his sin he made a vow to this woman that he had to fulfill and then he was sorry and it just reminds me of how uh, we may honor Jesus or want to honor Jesus and yet our sin causes us to turn away from him yeah, that's a good point. So he enjoyed listening to John. He really did. And yeah, was there maybe some conviction there? Yes. Was there repentance? No. And in a sense, when he put her in prison, or put him in prison, he was protecting him from his wife. His wife wanted to kill him. And we'll learn a little bit more about Herodias we're not going to spend any time on, you know, his daughter or his stepdaughter, if you will. And really, she's kind of a stepniece as well. The family interaction there is all over the board. The Herods, and we'll learn a little bit more about the Herods here in a minute, because they did have quite a lot of influence in Scripture in different places. We see Herod's name, and sometimes we get confused. There's so many Herods in there. So... So let's talk about Herod, and we'll come back to some of the things that might be a little odd about that particular movie, but there is pretty accurate, let's say that the type of party that they held at that time, and we'll talk about what that probably was, but it was much more the folks that were men that were invited, and yet you see a woman seated there. And you might think of it more about being a big bachelor's party, more than a birthday party with pin the tail on the donkey and maybe a pinata or something. That wasn't the type of party this was at all. And the fact that the daughter came in and her mom really must have brought her up right, it's her <clears throat> stepdaughter, but that she danced well enough to please the men. And so in whatever way she danced, she did something that made a guy so foolish to say one of the stupidest things ever. Mm -hmm. I'll give you half of my kingdom, just ask for it. So what happens when you have a depraved mind? You say stupid things, okay? So let's learn a little bit about Herod. <clears throat> more, consider this more of a background around some of the participants because we'll hit Herod and we'll hit some of the others as well. So the Herod dynasty, again, there's many more than just one Herod mentioned in scripture. This Herod dynasty, um, and they all have the word name Herod, kind of like Kennedy, or another political dynasty here. As a matter of fact, I looked up what were the five largest, and, and believe it or not, it actually came up, five largest political dynasties in the United States in our, in our history. And number one, they said, were the Bushes. Bushes. Yes, and so there's a history of folks that have been obviously in various positions in government, and that still carries on. And of course, here in Texas, we've got a young Bush that would like to become something very possible that we should just remember that maybe the, the dynasty needs to stop somewhere. <laughs> okay, and I'm saying that because what's my last name? Kennedy, which was coming up as number two. And the Kennedys were also corrupt. I, w I mean, again, not only my family, but the, the Kennedys that we know politically were very corrupt, starting with, of course, Joseph Kennedy. And even though he was an ambassador, he was very good at um, doing illegal things, even though he was appointed as ambassador. And of course, he had many kids that he wanted to have. One died in World War II, so that guy wasn't gonna become president, so let's take John. And then of course, we had some others in there, and then let's drive off and let somebody drown. And then, then they followed through a few more. We hope that the Kennedy dynasty has stopped. Um, who do you think was the third one, just out of curiosity? Clinton. Well, the Clintons were mentioned in there. The Roosevelt. The Roosevelts, okay. And the Roosevelts had obviously a history, okay. Who else? Adams. Adams, yeah, yeah. John Adams and John Quincy Adams. 
kind of skipped a little bit of time, and then we had the grandson that became president. I think, was that what it was, or was he the son? He was the son. Okay, and then the last one I was going to say, were, and this is going to be, you know, that one that you wouldn't probably normally get, Harrison's. That was where he was the president, then they skipped, and then there was another, the grandson became president. The first Harrison, he spent the longest time in office of 31 days. Okay, he preached too long, or he spoke too long in his inauguration, inauguration caught a cold, got pneumonia, and died. And then his grandson became president leader down the line. And I think there was a, somewhere in the middle, there was a senator of Ohio and so forth. Is all of that important? No, but there are dynasties, and this was a dynasty. But these folks were really evil. I mean, there's people that might be opportunistic, if you will, in government, and then there are people that are evil. So Herod the Great, he's kind of the granddaddy, if you will, of the bunch. He was called Herod the Great, but he really wasn't a great man at all. He ruled for 36 years or so. He had 10 wives. He was known to be very, very cruel. As a matter of fact, this is the same Herod that we hear about in Matthew chapter two, which because he heard about a king being born, he was so jealous he had to find that king. And fortunately, the wise men deceived him. He didn't like that, by the way. So what did he do? He slaughtered babies that were two years and under. Again, he was a tool of Satan at that time. Another way that Satan thought, hey, let's stop this whole deal that I know is coming, but maybe I'll take a good stab at it. And sure enough, what happens? Jesus lives. He heads down south with his parents. Um, anyway, that Herod the Great died in AD 4, give or take. Okay, now, um, one of the good things he did, if you will, and you got to put good in parentheses and so forth, was in 39 BC, he went to the temple that had been, you know, ruined, if you will. And at that point, it was actually kind of together. But what he did was he killed the priests and anybody defending the temple. Now, the Jews, you know, they don't get excited about people that do that, of course. And they really thought, well, maybe he was going to tear it down. Well, about 20 years later, he said he was going to rebuild it. Of course, the Jews didn't believe him. He did rebuild the temple. He made it larger because he said this temple is not as large as the original Solomon's uh, temple. It's 60 cubits smaller than it should be. He actually did rebuild it, much to the Jews' surprise. And so he rebuilds the temple. He rebuilds the court in the next eight years. Rebuilds the temple in less than two years. Rebuilds the court. And it becomes kind of a show place all about Herod. Now, why do you think he rebuilt the temple? Political reasons. Political reasons. Yeah. We all see that even in our government where people might not really care about us, perhaps. But they do things to appease us, to get us on their side. And the Jews were people that he had been treating cruelly. As a matter of fact, the apple doesn't fall from the tree because later on, his sons do a good job of doing the same type of thing, almost targeting the Jews, if you will. Um, okay, so that's Herod the quote-unquote great. Now, what do we know about the temple? I just kind of bridged together what's going on. David was king. He wanted to build a temple for God. And what did God say? No. Who's going to build the temple? Solomon. Now, you can supply all the stuff he's going to need, but Solomon's going to build the temple. So Solomon builds the temple. And then we kind of bridge together with what's going on in the fight for it story when we get into Ezra and Nehemiah and so forth. In 586 BC, who destroys the temple? Comes in and destroys it all? Babylonians, right? Now, finally, Ezra and Nehemiah, and in particular, a guy by the name of Zerubbabel, they are allowed to go and rebuild the temple, and they do. And so they rebuild the temple and so on and so forth. Um, after that, several Gentile kings, if you will, kind of destroy it, defile it, you know, degrade it, everything like that. But basically, it was due to the fact that the people just did not have a heart for God. And then it brings us up to the point when Herod rebuilds it. So there's the tie to Mark's sermon this morning. Excellent. Find it somewhere. Okay, so um, <laughs> let me see if I can use this pointer thing. Herod's kingdom 
included all of this area, all of this area, all of this area. It was a large kingdom. Now, the Herods were appointed by Rome. Okay, so they got Rome's blessing, support. They even make sure that they defend them, even though they have their own army, so to speak. They are also defending this area. But Herod dies, and he divides it up among four of his sons. And so what it looks like is this. And you don't hear much about this particular son. Lysanias, he gets this little chunk up here. That only lasts a couple of years, and then kind of melts back into Roman territory, if you will. Then there was a guy by the name of Philip, and Philip had this area, okay? You might wonder why, you know, there's a place called Caesarea Philippi. Yeah, that's because of Philip being the guy that runs this particular area. Then there is a guy by the name of Herod Antipas, which is kind of the featured guy today. That's him, that's that Herod. He's running Galilee and all of this area here. Okay. Lastly, there's a, a Herod, and his name is um, some big word that I probably have to spit out. Let's see what uh, Archelaus, A R C H E L A I S, and he actually got about half of the territory that his father <coughs> ruled. This is this entire section of all of Judea and Samaria. Now, interestingly enough, these guys get their territories and everything. This person kind of goes away very quickly. And this other guy, he is exceedingly evil. As a matter of fact, he is so cruel to the Jews that the Romans are perturbed by how bad he is. And they get rid of him. And suddenly this becomes a, an area that is run by a series of governors. And one of the governors is Pontius Pilate. So that's where later on we'll see him come into the play. He actually is the guy that will be the governor of that section. Okay, so what does all that mean to you? How do you apply it to your lives? Does it make you, you know, closer to Jesus or anything like that? Well, hang on a second. Um, there's also two other Herods. We've got Herod Agrippa I and Herod Agrippa II. And those are folks that if you've been in the book of Acts with us early or late, early last year, whatever it was, all of last year, um, we find out that there's these two Herods. One of them, is the guy that killed James. He was the first Christian mark. But he has James gone. The other one, uh, Agrippa II, he was instrumental in saving Paul's life when the Jews tried to get rid of Paul. So we don't know if any of these Herods, again, they were all evil. He had probably another scenario behind it, but there is absolutely no information whatsoever that any Herod or anybody in his family came to know Christ Jesus as, a, as their Savior. And what's interesting about it, of any group of quote-unquote rulers, these guys were confronted with it all the time. Jesus was brought to them. John the Baptist spoke with them, had it, you know, it was like, you might, you might imagine somebody like Franklin Graham who used to always work with and talk to Donald Trump. Now, when you have somebody, you know, that is known evangelist and as has his dad, Billy Graham, always in the having the ear of the president of the United States, you would think that some one of them, if not many of them, would say, you know what? You're right, Billy. No, you're right, Frank. I'm going to change my life and I'm going to dedicate it to Jesus Christ. In Herod's case, there's no real idea behind, did they ever? We don't think so. And most of them they basically um, inherited a lot of traits from their parents. So here's, here's that Herod Antipas. And again, he's the one that has those two sections, if you will. He's also known as Herod the Tetrarch. Now, Tetrarch isn't anything real fancy or anything. He just basically is talking about the fact that he owns or he controls a fourth is generally what that means. So he had kind of like a fourth of the kingdom. Didn't necessarily mean it geography, i.e. I've got 100 square miles and you're going to get 25 square miles and you're going to get 25, et cetera, et cetera. It was basically you got a fourth, whatever fourth that Herod the Great decided to give to him. Now, um, he's also the same guy that later on Pilate's going to send to him. 
You might remember it during Jesus' crucifixion that Pilate says, I find nothing wrong with this guy. And he sends him to this Herod. Mm -hmm. This Herod has been looking forward to meeting Jesus for a long time, as we'll learn in the story today. As a matter of fact, he found that he was very enamored and so forth with John. <laughs> and then he thought that John had actually been raised from the dead. So he's living with this superstition, probably not being able to sleep real, real well at night. As a matter of fact, I can imagine that he might even be thinking about this idea because he's hearing about Jesus. He's thinking it might be John the Baptist raised from the dead. Wait a second. If I think back 30 years or so, my dad, didn't he put a bunch of babies to bed, you know, because he got rid of that king? And so all of these things probably haunted him, which is a good thing. I'm glad it probably drove him nuts. And, and obviously you see from his relationships um, where, he's, where he came from. So anyway, um, he actually gets to the point, you know, when Jesus is sent to him, that he was so anxious to see him, he wanted to see if Jesus would perform some miracles for him. And he asked him many questions, but what did Jesus do? Nothing. Quiet, silent. He called Herod, this Herod, Jesus called this guy a fox. Okay? He looked at him as being sly, cunning, all the things that are negative when you hear the word fox. So nonetheless, he didn't do any miracles. He didn't talk to him. And he then, because he didn't do that, Herod allowed his soldiers to ridicule him and beat him and then send him back to Pilate. Interestingly enough, it was Jesus in that particular environment where Herod didn't like Pilate and Pilate didn't like Herod, but it says in scripture there that they became friends because of that interaction. You see, Jesus brings people together. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't the idea. So to, fear, to kind of sum up Herod, this Herod, this is Herod Antipas. He feared the people so much, and he kept, because of that fear, he kept John the Baptist from being killed. But he then feared his friends and what he might look like, how he might be, you know, gee, he didn't keep a promise when his stepdaughter danced for him. So he ended up being fearful even of his friends. He couldn't stand on his own two feet and admit that he has done something wrong. Um, he feared John, and it's going to go on. He said he feared John even in his death, because he thought John had come back from the dead. He even says, hey, I beheaded the guy. And yet he believed that it was John that had come back. Oddly enough, um, though he was confronted with it, he certainly didn't seem to fear everlasting judgment. You can bet on the fact, the way that John the Baptist spoke, that he made very clear that he needed to repent. Mm -hmm. And through all of that, being actually listening to uh, what Jesus calls the greatest person that ever lived, and obviously somebody that was fearless in his exposing people's sin, didn't seem to phase him. The idea of eternal judgment just didn't seem to phase him at all. Well, you know, it must have phased him a little bit. He didn't take any action. But like the fact that he liked to hear John, so right. I mean, I think it fazed him, but he just didn't want to give up his sin, right? Because he's living in Babylon. He's happy yeah. with his wife and her daughter and whatever, as gross as that is. Um, so, I mean, so you know what I'm saying? Like, so, oh, yeah. and I think that's like many of us, like, you know, we, we're intrigued, but we don't want to leave Babylon. So, again, and just kind of on that same deal, he's living this life, you know, of debauchery and luxury and everything else. Kind of turn on the TV and you can look at some of the rich and powerful people and they're doing the same thing with no fear of eternity. In his particular case, it said that he was being talked talk to by John in particular because he had married his brother's wife. Now it's not the same Philip that was up there in the corner up there. He had another half brother named Philip. Okay, so he had a whole brother named Philip and a half brother named Philip. But nonetheless, <laughs> the half brother, it was his wife that he married. Herod was married. He was married to the daughter of a king 
of a kingdom, if you will, that is, um, if I had the map up there, it'd be down in this area here. So if you got all of Israel and so forth, if you'd look down in that area, he was a king down there. And when he divorced his daughter, that king brought his troops to wage war against this guy. The only reason that he was left alive is the Romans' army came to save him. Um, so kind of a weird relationship. Yeah, I'm going to go marry you know my half-brother's wife, divorce my other wife. I've got a little bit of war going on here. Apparently the guy didn't like it, but I've got this new trophy wife, if you will. Um, it almost sounds like somebody from Hollywood. All right, then we have John the Baptist. Um, Mark 1, right out of the gate, when we started covering this back last year, we learned that he was a messenger, that he was prophesied prior to coming, uh, not only in Isaiah, it's also in Malachi, to be the forerunner of Jesus, to prepare the way for Jesus' coming. And so certainly he was out there preaching a baptism of repentance. Make straight your ways of the Lord, repent, etc. And of course, we also know that he baptized Jesus. Now, Jesus said of John, and I mentioned this earlier, in Matthew 11, 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there, is, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. What an endorsement from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords uh, of John the Baptist. Scruffy, eat locusts, live out in the wilderness, you know, but people went out to him because they wanted to hear him. And they thought of him as being, perhaps he was Elijah, perhaps he was a prophet, like a prophet of old. Um, different, perhaps, in a lot of ways, but captivating and sharing with them things that nobody else had ever shared with them before. So let me ask you this. How did John roll into this story? Obviously, again, um, and this is per Josephus, John had actually become very popular. The population of Jews was now going to him, wherever he was at, out in the wilderness and so forth, and they were listening to him. John was having an impact on the populace. And so King Herod got word of some of that. Um, and again, he got audience with <coughs> Herod. And so in that particular audience that he had with Herod, he was being told that he should I had a little pop-up pop here, so that's why I'm trying to get rid of it. Now there's two pop-ups. Now they're gone. Anyway, um, he had become very popular. Now, so in that, if he had lived today, he would be on Instagram with thousands of followers. He would have Facebook likes and everything like that. He would be looked, it, maybe people would put him on Spotify and he would have you know, the largest crowd ever of people that wanted to dial in and see what he had to say. That's how popular he had become. And when he became popular, that became a threat. And so therefore, when he spoke against Herod and Herodias and their relationship, that's when the hammer began to fall. So uh, that's a problem, okay? Uh, so John was in prison. As a matter of fact, at the time this story comes up, he had been in prison for about a year. And though Herod was perplexed at his teaching and everything, he enjoyed listening to him. I don't know if that meant that he went down to the prison, which, again, the, the movie kind of depicts like he, they almost went downstairs and put him in a dungeon or something like that. Historians say, and I, I don't know, so, uh, but historians say the prison likely was going to be several miles away from where the palace was. There wasn't necessarily a dungeon in the prison, per se. So that kind of goes very quickly. You know, again, so with that in mind, the movie shows it out pretty quickly. We didn't want to make it into a several hour movie of them going off, bringing his head back, you know, and doing all the things there. Nonetheless, he liked him great. But Herod's wife still wanted to kill him. So Herod, kind of in contrast, when you contrast John and Herod, Herod lived in fear. He feared the people, feared his friends, feared John, even in his death. John the Baptist, he had no fear. He knew what he was doing and what he was there for. Um, I should also mention that he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. So, Scripture obviously shows us that um, prophets don't necessarily have easy lives. As a matter of fact, very few of their lives on earth end in a good way. 
And what kind of sums it up is the writer of Hebrews in this verse that hopefully is up there. And it says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Kephath, and of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of the lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight, Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. And again, uh, history, or at least the common understanding of history, is that Isaiah was sawn in two. Um, they were killed with the sword. They went about their about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These men of God, these prophets, these that are foretelling, preaching God's word. God has said, hey, go and tell this group. Tell this to Nineveh. Tell this to this group. Tell this to that group. Um, how about this King Ahab and his wife Jezebel? You tell them. And I can imagine if I was a prophet, say, hmm, maybe is there somebody else? And we've heard that before. Not all of these prophets just said, okay, I'm running right for it now. Some of them were reluctant prophets. But again, there were men of God and others that were going out and boldly proclaiming the truth. So that kind of summed it up. I thought that might be the best way to sum it up. So Herodias. And the verse says, And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him put to death. Now, this particular picture right out of the movie, it looks like she probably would hold a grudge. As, interesting, as I was looking at the, you know, Herodias, I pulled up some things, and there's some women's ministry that actually speak to women. And one of their things I found on two different ones, where they talk about how not to be like Herodias and the fact that you should not hold a grudge, as if it's only women that hold a grudge, right? <laughs> okay. I, I think that kind of goes even with your you know, male counterparts. But she's like the ultimate wicked stepmother. She really is. Uh, Disney couldn't put somebody together quite like this, I'm sure. Uh, because the problem is that she's just not fictitious. She was real. And she had a grudge. Why? Because John called her out. He called her out for being immoral. And like other, unlike other immoral women that came to Jesus... The difference was she didn't repent. She doubled down on holding a grudge. You may remember others, even ones that would wash his feet and so forth, uh, with their hair. Other immoral women were saved. It wasn't like, hey, she's so immoral she's beyond that. Not possible. Nobody's beyond the saving power of Jesus Christ. But in this particular case, her heart and heart kind of gave it a whole new meaning. She was obviously short-sighted, heart of heart, a schemer that enlisted her stepdaughter uh, to be an accomplice to murder. Lastly, here is Herodias' daughter as, as, as shown, and she reminds me of somebody that I won't mention. Um, her name is actually Salome, or Salome, not like Salome. But anyway, her name is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. Josephus, first century historian, known to be exceptionally accurate, backs up a lot of scripture, but not a Christian. He actually gives a great degree of, uh, proves the authenticity of scripture. And so he said, her name is Salome. Um, so the other group I'll just mention briefly is the party guests. You know, first off, there's only two birthdays mentioned in the Bible, and both had negative uh, consequences, if you will, when they were mentioned. The first one was the birthday celebration of Pharaoh, and he had the cupbearer killed. And this is the second one, where John the Baptist was killed. Um, some cults don't believe in birthdays. As a matter of fact, I, I learned, and this is the first time I learned that, was Commonly having birthday parties in the United States, it was not common until late in the 19th century. So I'm on the right track. I just have anniversaries of my 49th birthday. 
okay? So that's just the way it works. Um, anyway, it did not become common until the 19th century, late in the 19th century. So it was mentioned that by one commentator that these type of birthdays in Rome were not again one of those festive type of things. It was more of a men's group, um, kind of a debauchery, party, drunkenness, women and so on and so forth. Just an ungodly bachelor party. So whatever that looks like, and I haven't been to a, a bachelor party other than a Christian one, which was not much at all. Um, Imagine what that might look like. And again, verse 21 said the people that are actually in attendance there were his nobles, his military commanders, and the leading men of Israel. So again, he's kissing up to the right people, inviting to the birthday. Herod shows us again in his corrupt mind, again, who's going to say something like that? I'll give you anything you want. Okay, great, up to half the kingdom. And so she goes out and she asks her mother, what should I do? So she's obviously in on this plot. And he says, hey, get the head of Baptist, uh, John the Baptist, and have him bring it on a platter. And she dances off and goes on up to Herod. And sure enough, he may have been bothered by the request, but he didn't, wasn't a man enough or he wasn't strong enough to say no. And so anyway, the head of John the Baptist was brought to him at some point. Probably not as instantly as the movie shows. So I was thinking, um, I know that barbaric things happen. We know ISIS cuts off people's heads and everything, and I wasn't going to put all some of the things that I saw, uh, even on John the Baptist. But what's interesting is this. During that period of time, it was not unusual to have that type of gruesome presentation of a head. Okay, if we go back uh, into, let's say, the time of Mark Anthony and so forth, you know, you had Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, Julius Caesar. If you go back and, you know, whatever you might have been able to remember. So there was a guy by the name of Cicero. Cicero? Somebody pronounce it for me. Cicero. Um, and so he was a Roman statesman, a philosopher, a very well-educated guy. He was a lawyer and everything like that. He vowed and he had wanted nothing to do with the way Rome was going. He wanted it to be a a lot more different in the way that it was being operated. So what happened to him? He continued to speak out. And ultimately, Mark Anthony had his head severed and his hands cut off. And symbolically, the idea is he's no longer going to speak against me and he's no longer going to be able to write negative things about me. And he was put on display like that. And his wife... F-A-I-B-L-O. Anyway, his wife, who cares what her name is, she was a lot like this gal. She was so incest that she got a hold of the head, pulled out his tongue, and started stabbing it with her hairpin. Great. Yeah, nice, nice people back then. Anyway, so this is the same type of thing, and it was not necessarily something that was unusual. Um, and so immediately it talks about how the executioner went and they brought his head back. So a question here, kind of summing up a couple things. Um, we obviously have the, con the conflict of two different worldviews. And we think, well, sometimes maybe it was today. But we're going to talk about this particular period of time. What does the story of John the Baptist's death or John the Baptist's life and death teach us as we see it today? True to his calling. John the Baptist stayed true to his calling. Might cost you your head to do that. Might, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. When we are here, even at City Rise, right now in the United States, we enjoy the freedom of religion, if you will. And we have the opportunity, the freedom to share our faith. And yet what we do see is people that speak out are becoming more and more silenced. And we think, that's really strange, it's really odd. We hate to see it going on and it bothers me. And you know, rips your, your gut to know that your nation is changing in some fashion. But you have to also remember that there's other places in the world where that is commonplace. We should have never gone to China and participated in the Olympics. Those folks are ruthless. And there are Christians that are being killed. And there's Christians that have cameras on them all the time because they have more cameras than they have people. And they track those folks. I know that um, Julie and I, uh, does, but 
you know, I, I support Voice of the Martyrs, and I get all of their stuff and their books and everything else. And I know and get the newsletters on a weekly basis of what's going on in the world and what's going on in China. And it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But these folks are willing to give their lives. But the exciting thing about that, though, is the church grows under persecution. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We don't, like to, we don't like to think about that, but that's when the church grows is when... Under when the church is under persecution, as it did even in, Old, in New Testament times, but in China and in Iran and other places, the church is beginning. And the church in China is thriving. There's hundreds, if not tens of thousands, if not a million underground churches. They can't meet in very large groups, but they know who's going to them now because you got a camera on you all the time. Yes. And Jill. also in Iran, the church is just growing like crazy. Yes. Actually, that's the most exciting thing I like to read is about what's going on in Iran. Because when we think of Iran, we think of cruelty, we think of these people that death to America, we think of everything about how authoritarian that country is. There's also churches in North Korea, even though often they escape out. Um, but nonetheless, some of the most difficult mission fields that aren't truly mission fields because we can't get true missionaries and already have planted folks in there. Um, and again, Voice of the Martyrs brings smuggles in Bibles everywhere and everything like that. And it's a great ministry to support. Now, you know, it's just one of those things that makes it difficult for us to understand what's going on outside of the United States. Can I just add something? Please, please. Um, there's ministrywatch.com looks at all, they look at the form 990, which, which is a form that all these uh, nonprofits have to file with the IRS. And they analyze the usage of funds, the percentage ratios for how much they spend for um, fundraising. They list the salaries of all the board members or, uh, you know, executives. But it's really helpful to me to use. And actually, Voice of the Martyrs is sort of not real high on their, you know, they're kind of right. average. But um, World Vision and World Health and Samaritan's Purse are higher. I'm yes. just, but they change. And it, if you go to ministrywatch.com, you can read their analysis, and it's really helpful. And I've even called them before. Mm -hmm. Yep. I called them about our ministry here, hmm. and the lady helped me go through the Form 990 for. Um, Did you find out that the, CASA group is looking at or not? CASA. Well, I told you the numbers, <laughs> and, but it's. I'm just throwing that just because something's mm. visible doesn't mean they right. utilize funds well or, you know. Anyway. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Samaritan's Purse, we used to give to World Vision. We stopped because they got a little wonky in one area. Um, Samaritan's Purse is one that we joyfully give to. Steve. So, so I'm thinking about the question. Mm -hmm. The way I, what I've learned from it, uh, what it, what it taught me was just thinking about how um, John the Baptist was pursuing righteousness. Mm -hmm. And he received the highest uh, amount of praise from Jesus himself. He said earlier that yes. this is the greatest man ever. And one of the Beatitudes, it says in Matthew, uh, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And if I think about righteousness, that word means you're essentially following God's moral standard. That's what righteousness is. John the Baptist was following God's um, moral standard, and of course he was he was putting it on Herod, and for that for that reason he was persecuted. But um, <clears throat> Jesus' words are always true; therefore, he will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, in tying that together, and. Robert's doing a good segue for me. The um, thing that I was looking at, I did a kind of a side study on was, we see Herod, which I characterized with the word wickedness, and John the Baptist, which I characterized with the word righteousness. 
And so scripture has a lot to say about the wicked and has a lot to say about the righteous. And again, it kind of dovetails exactly as to where you are coming from, Robert. But what I started to do, and I realized, by the way, there's not, we're not going to cover all 539 verses. <laughs> we're just going to cover a few. Very quickly, and I'm going to read them, then we're done. Um, but when you look at the contrast, that's the difference. Herod was a wicked man. Our world is lost. They need to know Jesus. John the Baptist, on the other hand, fearlessly continued to preach the word, even at the cost of his life, as did many of the early apostles, like all of them except the apostle John, were killed in some fashion. And so throughout history, that continued to happen to Christians that would take a stand, take a stand. So um, real quickly, Psalm 34, 21, affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate righteous, the righteous will be condemned. Herod and others. Psalm 37, 12, and 23, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. That's what's going on throughout some of these different countries. Isaiah 59, 7, their feet run to evil, and we're talking about the wicked, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of inequity. Desolation and destruction are their highways. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the powers, the principalities, the rulers and dark places, etc., etc. That's where our battle is at, and it kind of goes with, you know, the fight for it battle. Their end is destruction, and this is the wicked. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. And lastly, on this side of the column, <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians 1.9, they will suffer the punishment of the in, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. We have something to look forward to in eternity. All of the things that bother us now about the evil that we see going on in the world and all of the various things that are corrupt and everything, this side of heaven, we're in it. <laughs> that side, when we are there, in God's presence, it's not. It's perfect. On the other side here, it all shows up at once because I didn't take time to break it out. Um, Psalm 1-6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Second one there, For you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as with a shield. He is going to cover us as with a shield. John the Baptist probably did not feel any pain he felt joy the moment after it happened. And you know what? <clears throat> sometimes I wish that I could suddenly be in that type of presence just like that. The things that sometimes hang, I hang on to in this world, I've got grandkids. You know, and uh, I want to do things to help change this world to be better. But I want to be a positive influence to them and make sure that they know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. That's the one thing that I wrote to all of my kids when they were very young before they could read the letter was just be there. All things aside, be there. And be there meaning in heaven. Um, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy. All you who are upright in heart Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. That is a great promise. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. I know nobody in here has any times of trouble, right? Okay, in times of trouble, that's a great one. Some of these, a couple of these verses were ones that I actually had on a long piece of paper that I read when I was in court for way too long, <laughs> two weeks. Um... The last one, Matthew 7 and 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, who enter by it, are many. So we shouldn't be disturbed, and the fact is, it's, there's going to be few that listen to the Lord. We shouldn't be disturbed that this congregation is not one of the ones that goes out there and they have, you know, light shows and everything else. And there's thousands of people that want to have their tongues and their ears tickled and everything like that. God's calling the right people right here. 
And I think Mark did a great job in the sermon this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, nice, short, concise. I like his short sermons, but it always has something that I can take away. And so let's, uh, let me just close real quickly and pray. I'll turn it back over to Lorraine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and look into your word. And Lord, this section on John the Baptist, is as gruesome as it is, as terrible and wicked as the people involved in that particular story and that time of history were, we know that you used John the Baptist to share with many, to make your paths straight, to welcome the Lord Jesus Christ into his earthly ministry. And Lord, we know that he's alive today and he's mm -hmm. sitting at the right hand of the Father and that he is with each one of us in the sense that we know that we are in a battle and that he is the king. And our reward is in heaven, not here. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.